busy talking to somebody else for a gun. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, we're set. Okay, fine. Well, I just got here in time. Today we're taking up recursive filters. We have an input UN. And they got some coefficients C, uh, CN. N running from 0 to K. N minus. C, oh, I'm sorry, CK N minus K. K running from 0 to capital K. And we also have some Y's. And so we get a new Y, N, is that summation running from 1 to K of some DKs. That is, I use K, o, K plus 1 old values, the current value and K old ones, and I use old Y values, and I get a new Y value. If these were not there and this were symmetric, I'd have had a recursive a non-recursive filter. Now, the two Ks I make the same because if they weren't the same, I'll put zeros in the other till both of them are the same. I use the current value, n minus k here, k equals zero. I use the current y uh, n value, u n value, but I don't use the current one here. If I use the current one here, I could transpose over, divide through, and not have it. So putting one here to k and zero to k capital K, is no real difference than zero to K. Now, this is what is traditionally a recursive filter. If you're trying to predict a position of an airplane, you do not have other than current and past data. And you have past predictions to make the current prediction you want to make. Now, you might ask, well, why don't you use both sides here? Well, in the case of the airplane, I don't have new values beyond the present time. So it's one-sided. It's physically realizable, as they call it. But let me remind you that experiments are now done very frequently in the laboratory. They're recorded on a tape, and the future's right down there on the tape. So there's no reason why you could not have, in many problems, both sides for the input data. You could also assume some other out there, you'd be driven to solving a set of simultaneous linear equations. That's not something to be terrible about, but traditionally, this is the form. And that's the form I'm going to look at. It's traditional. If you have a picture, and you're trying to smooth the picture or analyze the picture, you've got the stuff on all sides, this is ridiculous. You ought to be using information all around the point you're trying to smooth. And you can use some smooth values, yes, but you ought to be using that. Now, the main thing about this I want to point out is that feedback. Any y value I calculate goes back in here, affects the next value. Therefore, the method can be unstable, and I must look at filters from the point of view of stability. Will the thing run away or will it not? Typically, stability comes out in oscillation, but it can be exponential growth. I have to worry about that thing. Now, as I said to you last time, I had actually done something like this where these were y n minus k primes. They were derivative values of a differential equation. Therefore, I had a second feedback path. Through the differential equation, y prime equals f of x and y. So there are two feedback paths, and I had more trouble. But I had to work this out, so I really did know something about feedback paths. And stability is the major problem. 
I need to tell you about the nature of stability, although you had courses in it. A good story about myself is that I was at one time doing, many years ago, I was a host on six half-hour television programs on computers, and I would go out to San Francisco, I was living in the East, uh, and would do the things, station KQED. And I learned after a little while that it's wise to stay in the same hotel room regularly. Because then if you got to get up in the middle of the night, things are familiar. If you come in late, things are familiar. It's the same room with the same view and the same yellow rugged floor and so on. But the shower was a very interesting shower. The plumber had put big diameter pipes here. What happened? Well, I turn on the water, and it's cold coming out. I turn up the hot water more and more and more, and finally the water's reasonably really warm. I get in. The hot water comes up there, and it's too hot. I have to hop out and turn it down. I have trouble. As long as I stay in that room, I have trouble every morning trying to get that shower adjusted. Now why? It's shown you very clearly one of two ways of explaining the trouble. Either there was too long a time between when I adjust the temperature until it got to me to sense it. Or alternatively, I change it too fast. Both stories will explain what happens in instability. Now you know this when you're first learning to drive a car. You find the car headed for the curb, you yank the wheel over, you're headed for the other curb. Too strong a correction. Either you can call it too strong or too late, but that's the nature of feedback. And that's what causes trouble. If these coefficients here, some of these are very big, the feedback here, a small area here, we fed back to bigger error, around and around it will go. It's a very, very touchy problem and one which you have to look at. Now, I want to get at this problem. It's linear, so I'm going to have an input. The input that's the UN. And the output A output E to the I omega N. When I put those in, you can see E I omega N is going to cancel out, and I'm going to get Y N is summation CK or A input. Bring the Y terms over, factor them out, and solve for this, this ratio, A output over A input. What's the transfer function? The transfer function A output over A input is exactly that ratio. Well now, when we had recursive filters, I mean non-recursive filters, we had a theory of Fourier series to represent the function. We have no theory of how to represent a transfer function may want as a ratio of two Fourier series. It's not that such a theory couldn't exist, we don't have it. So we cannot have a systematic method of design because we have no method of doing what Kaiser did, take the Fourier expansion and work on bing, 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 straight down the line because I can't take the first step. As a result, I have a bunch of special techniques, Butterworth filters, Chebyshev 1, Chebyshev 2, and elliptic. Butterworth is a fairly standard one. Chebyshev 1 tries to keep the equal ripples in the stop band. Chebyshev 2, I think, puts it in the pass band, elliptic integrals, elliptic filters, which gets the name because they use elliptic functions, keeps the ripples equal in both. Those are particular techniques of getting particular answers. And I don't think we need to take them up here because I don't want to get involved in it. Now these filters are called IIR. 
infinite impulse response, meaning if I put a pulse in here, it'll appear in the Y, it'll appear in the next Y, it'll go around this way, and it will die out in a geometric regression at best if it doesn't grow. So the claim is that this should be called an infinite impulse response, whereas a non-recursive one, once you pass a, a peculiar value and it's no longer in the range of what you're summing, it's gone. This has, in some sense, an infinite memory. A disturbance once put in here will keep on going around this path, gradually fading, 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 but it won't disappear. Well, I'm me, you know, and I'm a dog. And I said to myself, is it true that every filter of that type must have something that goes on forever? So I set out to find one that doesn't. And sure enough, I find a filter which does not, that a pu impulse put in disappears completely after a finite number of steps. Not just fades slowly, but practically does. Now, it's not necessarily the filter you want to design, but it is one of those things I want to call your attention to. I will talk about experts in a later lecture, 23 or something, the curse of an expert. But what happens is this. The student taking the course is told that these filters have infinite impulse response. They all have. And they repeat this. And they repeat it generation after generation. And they never ask themselves, is it true? Does everyone always have one? Or is it possible, as I ask myself, is there a finite one? I have found out that the experts know everything, but they never really question. They took what they were told in class and they believed it and repeated it to the next person without genuine examining. Here's a simple trivial case where examining things said, well, no, some of them could be finite. You may not want to build those kind, but there can exist finite impulse response filters of that type. So the general name is not so good. Now I want to turn to a story because I'm really interested in telling you stories about how things go. A lady in our department, math department at that time, stopped me one Monday morning and remarked about a guy she'd been square dancing with, a guy over in physics. He was measuring energy. There were 256 values. And he was mounting the counts. Number of nuclear counts. Because you know, nuclear experiments have a random element behind them. You're not going to get a smooth curve unless you run to a tremendous length of time. Well, she says, this man wants the derivative of that curve. I said, he's got a, quite a problem, hasn't he? And I walk off. We parted. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that guy needed some help. I need a lot of help because finding a derivative of a curve is a very, very difficult business. And if there's a fair amount of noise, it's going to be very hard for him. So I look him up to the telephone directory. I call him up. Yes, he says, I got a problem. I can come up to your office. I said, nope, I'll meet you in your lab. How about my office? I said, no, I'll meet you in your lab. It's the only place I'll meet you. Why? I want to look at this guy's equipment. Is he really a good physicist? Shall I spend a lot of time trying to get an answer for him? Or is he just one of the average bunch of people who's never going to do anything and it doesn't matter what he does? Well, it's evident he knows his business. Coming from Los Alamos, I knew something about nuclear shielding and he had done it carefully and well. He was running an experiment for a week to gather data. You can't run ten times as long. I mean, a week's time to get one set of data is kind of painful. So he, but there's a lot of other small things which we talk about, and I've come away with a clear impression. A, he knows how to do experimentation, and B, he's a smart man. I'm sorry, three things. C, the problem is important not only to physics, but also to Bell Laboratories. Therefore, I've got to help to get an answer. Now, I commend this attitude toward you, to you. Find the people who are doing important things and help them get important results. Most people are not doing anything important and never going to do anything important, so it doesn't matter whether you help them or not. Nothing is going to come up with it. 
So there's a case. Now, I look at the thing for a long while and go away and I think about it and I say, oh, my friend Jim Kaiser, who was, I told you earlier, was teaching me how to do digital filters. He is an expert. He ought to know. So let me go down to Jim and ask him what I should do. Well, that's where we have trouble. Kaiser has always thought of data, time, and either current or voltage. And the area underneath the curve, or the square underneath the curve, was the energy. Here, energy is this variable. That's the number of counts. I have repeated trouble with Kaiser. I talk to him in the morning. I go to lunch with him, he's confused. I come back in the afternoon, he's still confused. Next morning, I keep straightening him out, and he's confused again. Now, Kaiser's a very smart guy. Very smart. But I was asking a problem. But he learned it this way, in this mold. Time, and either voltage or current. And here, energy, which should be the square underneath the curve, and the number of counts. I finally had to say to Kaiser, that this is time, and that's voltage. Now, how do I do it? Well, we go a little further. I go down to the physicist and say, give me a picture of what you theoretically expect. Let's model this and calculate some pseudo data based on your model, and I will calculate the power spectrum. And sure enough, this is 1 half, this is 1 40th. 1920th is flat noise, all the signals down in here. So next we take a run of his data. We again calculate the power spectrum. The same thing. A miracle. Theory and practice agree. The man is a good man. So what Kaiser has to do is clearly design a filter, a low pass differentiator. Nineteen twentieths of stuff can be removed because in a differentiator you don't dare to let the high frequency come through because the derivative of E to the I omega T is I omega E to the I omega T and high frequency is amplified. You really must get it out. Well gradually it's clear that I've got the thing started. I turn it over to Kaiser and the other guy to work it out. Now Kaiser is a good man. What he does, he supplies to the physicist a program which will take the cutoff the man wants, design the filter, find the Fourier coefficients, design the filter, find which window to use, put the window on, and then process the data the man has. He picks the cutoff frequency he wants. So everything going along fine, but I happen to meet the guy we're talking about one time, and I find out two things. One, he has been trying various parts of data, moving the cutoff frequency one place or another to see if he couldn't get better results. And I had to say some rather strong words to him. You know something about degrees of freedom. If I let you play and adjust everything, you'll get any answer you want. You may not make these adjustments unless you allow for degrees of freedom and the accuracy of the answer. You are kidding yourself most of the time when you do this. And he had to confess he did know something about it, and really he was in statistical sin. The other is a much more subtle point. If these are the counts, I'll call them n sub k, he should really work in the square root of the n sub k, because they are the numbers which will have equal variance. And he's going to combine numbers, various numbers together in a filter like that. They're going to be combined. Therefore, he should work the square. I let him alone for quite a while until they were happy. And then I leaned on him on this, and I leaned on him four or five or six times before he allowed that if he wanted to get the ultimate information out of his data, he should really work in the square root of the number of counts so the variance of the term being combined with equal variance, and he will not have trouble with noise. This is a more subtle point, and it took a good deal more arguing on my part to win the argument, but I think I got it. The result was that he and Kaiser wrote a classic paper which definitively opened the field for how they could do those kind of experiments and get results. 
Now this is one of those things that I've had trouble with before. Some physicist does an experiment, he's got the data, and now you have to reduce it. If you could have gotten in there first, it would be one thing. But he's not the only one in which he did the right things instinctively. Except for the square of counts, he was doing things pretty much correct. And he did things right, he opened the door, new field. I did another one of the physicists who I disliked the guy thoroughly. I don't think the story comes in here, uh, the book. He made exactly the right measures. The back end, it was just right. In the beginning, I wondered. He was first starting out an experiment in one, let's see, 10 to minus, about uh, somewhere in the middle to microseconds, he was making the first measurement after he started. And he was making measurements for weeks, spaced out further and further and further and further apart. I thought it was kind of strange, but at the back end, when I finally beat him down and we got the thing going, he had made exactly the right measurements. So you will find frequently that the man making the measurements may not, as from a theoretician's point of view, know what he's talking about. But he very well may know better than you do what is the right stuff to measure. Some people have it, most people don't. These two guys did. And in both cases, we opened the door on a new field of research which could not be done before, but we found methods of finally getting at that whole area. So it's a very important proposition. Now, what's my contribution to the whole business? I obviously am proud of it. I did it. My contribution was to identify the problem, get the two people together who were going to do the work, and Kaiser also knew his business. He ultimately gave the man the program so the man could run what he wanted to. And all I did was try to keep them statistically honest. This is more and more the situation is needed. We are specializing more and more and more. As a result, people know less and less about the general business. And we need people who play the role I did, which I learned from John Tukey. How to see the bigger picture and keep them honest in the bigger picture. Because if you let them get lost to a smaller picture, they will do some pretty strange things at times. How to acquire the education, I do not know. I was somewhat specially trained, but the war did something for my whole generation. It grabbed us out of our comfortable ruts, shoved us in someplace else, and we adjusted gladly. For example, I got shoved lost almost and I had to learn computing. I thought nothing of it. I had to learn. A lot of us had to learn new things rather than what we never would have done otherwise, but we learned it willingly because it was a war going on. We saw the need for it. We didn't argue. We went out and did it. That's how we got breadth of knowledge. Furthermore, I come to Bell Labs. I suddenly find this crazy organization, math department, who thinks that all of mathematics is network theory. I know perfectly well it isn't. And they don't know anything about computing. I know perfectly well computing is important. Uh, but I get a whole view. And since I'm the only one who can compute at Bell Labs, I find myself running around the whole of Bell Labs, doing problems. Now, it didn't start out that way. I brought it on myself. The way accounting was done, I may have told you, it originally was, since it was the math department, the math department didn't do anything anyhow. We had what you'd call a slush fund. We'd always spend money and not be accountable for it. We had a case number I may still be able to remember, 20878, I think. You just wrote that down. That's what I did all week, 20878 meaning I didn't do anything. <laughs> Not for the labs, there's nothing you charge against. Well, as computing got larger and began to involve more money, we started charging by the vice presidential areas. Now, at that time, I already had a conscience about working for the whole Bell Labs and not the math department. So I would go around and find some big wheel in each department, not necessarily a vice president, but somebody, and remark to him, you know, this is being loaded on the whole company and it's partly being charged on this and that, and you aren't getting your money's worth. 
these computers going on, you're not getting your money's worth. That was back before we charged the vice president's areas. But it's over the whole labs. Well, within a few weeks, I would find somebody from that area coming around saying, well, Hamming, can you do such and such? I had set out a program to try and spread computing throughout the whole Bell Labs by that simple psychological thing. Now, it was charged by vice presidents. I went down to department heads and said, well, you know, there's all this computing capacity, which uh, is charging your vice presidential area, but you aren't getting anything. And you know people, they're greedy. So pretty soon I had some problems from them. And this way I got people involved in computing, psychologically. Easy trick. Now, the signal processing, you tend to think, all of you still, in spite of the story I told you right here, of signal processing being in time, as Kaiser did. Well, yes, and you're also thinking of radar things or underwater sound or something else like that. Yes, but when you are near the top, you begin to ask yourself, what is the Navy doing? How is the tonnage of ships versus the firepower changing over the years. The data is noisy. You can build a very simple filter, desire a fairly crude one, and smooth it in your office without any trouble, even only a hand calculator if you want, and find out pretty much what is going on independent of local noise. There are any number of problems that you can look at from old data. Now I'll warn you about old data later on in the talk, but nevertheless, when you want to find bigger trends, there's a lot of noise in all data. You're going to want to filter it out. And you could, if you wanted to, over a lifetime, design 10 or 20 different filters to get at 10 or 20 different kind of questions you wanted. Thus, although you tend to think of filters designed for filter out noise in submarines or in airplanes or something else, if used right, most filters will be one or two shot jobs. You do it for a couple of while, and then you're off on some other problem. You should design many more simple little filters than these exquisite ones which you need for gun directors and so on. But uh, I probably can't persuade you to do this. That there is an enormous amount of knowledge we learned out there. You've already got the records. They need some filtering to remove noise to get some understanding of what's going on. Now these filters work on linear. So I want to talk about a nonlinear filter. There are an infinite number of nonlinear filters. I'm only going to talk about one, so you'll see what kind of things can be done. I'm going to take two k plus one points and take the median. All right. Suppose I have some data. There's a jump. Well, so long as I'm over here, k plus 1 will be up there, and I'll have a point up there. The moment I jump to k plus 1 on this side, only k on that side, the thing will drop down to here. That kind of filter will follow a sudden change in state. Right? Most of the filters you got would have tried some Gibbs phenomenon, wiggle around, and then somebody have a big transitional. This kind of a filter, a running median, will s take care of following discontinuities, a change of state of some apparatus. For example, in radar, there is one search mode for searching whether there is a target out there, and there's another mode entirely when you have got the thing on the target and you're trying to track it. There are two different modes of operation. First, can I find a target? Having found it, can I track it? Frequently, you have these discontinuous changes. You can very well use this kind of a filter on one side. When you come near the discontinuous change, a running median or some other nonlinear filter will do the trick. The number of nonlinear filters is enormous. The trouble is, there isn't much theory. Those filters, they work great when the underlying mechanism is linear. When the underlying mechanism is not linear, it depends. If there's a noise around there, uh, you're all right, it's additive. 
In this multiplicative noise, uh, well, the story is a little bit different. The idea is the noise is additive, and I will filter out the additive noise. If it's multiplicative, it's a little bit more trouble, because the noise is bigger when the numbers are big than it's small, which is characteristic of floating point numbers. And a great many other things. The bigger it is, the relatively bigger, not relatively bigger, the bigger is the noise, but relatively bigger it may be small. So you have a great deal of problems there. Now, what am I trying to say in this lecture? It's one of these general lectures which I'm trying to use technical knowledge to get at your habits of thinking and point out how the normal person operates and how they don't do much. Almost everybody is going to be a nobody in history. History cannot stand a larger or more famous people. Everybody can't be a famous person. No way. My task, I keep telling you, is to increase the number of great people who go through my hands being lectured. And my method is not to preach abstract principles in a vacuum, although I have to extract them now and then. It is by telling you simple stories which carry a great deal of conviction. That story I told you today about the lady, what well, was a casual contact? She just casually mentioned it. I had the wit to hear. But even so, I dismissed it for a while, went back to my office and sat down, began in the core of my mind, that was nagging me a little bit. Yes, that was a difficult problem. Yeah, it's a difficult problem, Bell Labs. I'm part of Bell Labs. It's part of my problem. I cannot dismiss it by saying, oh, that's none of my business. I'm over here in math property. He's over in physics. That's, who cares? I could be sorry, I got plenty of other things to do. It's obvious I should think to you that people who only worry about their own little area, for example, if they're submariners and only think about submarines, I can't make them chief of staff. The person I can make chief of staff is the person who's conscious of the needs of the whole, not of the parts. The same applies to a corporation. You put a salesman in charge of a company, he'll put more money into sales, and sales will go up, but quality manufacturing will probably go down. You put a manufacturing guy in charge, and the quality of the product will come out great, but nobody will be selling it. You'll have the stuff on the loading platform, unsold. You can see the trouble. The problem is, how can I get you to quit being average and open your eyes, as somehow I did at Bell Labs, my conscience got me. Yes, it's a problem within Bell Labs. I work for Bell Labs. Furthermore, it's an interesting uh, problem in all science. I'm a scientist. Yes, I owe them an answer, the best I can do. In this case, I didn't really deliver the answer, but yes, I did. Kaiser and he wrote the paper. And that's another thing I want to discuss with you very carefully. I worked with a great many experimentalists over various times and made various suggestions. I never, never dared to write up a paper jointly and publish it, or joint paper my own. I did nothing. If they wrote up the paper and put me as a co-author, I would sign. But I dared never write the paper myself, even despite the fact I thought the whole thing was mathematical. Because if I had, I would have acquired the reputation of stealing other people's ideas. And if you get a reputation of stealing other people's ideas, you aren't going to hear other people's ideas. I had the reputation of working with people and never stealing anybody's ideas at all. If they wanted to publish it separately, they could. If they wanted to publish jointly, they could do it. I would sign, probably, but not always. It's a very difficult problem how you build up a reputation or organization. One of the things you certainly want is people will trust you. People trusted me, they trusted me, I would not do this. Well, you have the same thing. As you live your career, how do you behave in such a way that in general you'll be known as a person who can be relied on? That's part of the job. There's an enormous number of things beside the thing right in front of your face to do. 
there's a job to do, you gotta get this such and such bill, you gotta inspect this thing, or approve this contract, or do something else like that. Yes, that's one of the things. But there's a bigger goal. The organization has need of capable people. It's my considered opinion over many, many years, we have many more important jobs than we have important people to fill them. I don't want to make invidious remarks if you're Republicans or Democrats, but I think, you look back at several previous presidents, the job was bigger than the guy who had the job. And so it is many times. The president of the company needs, the company needs a better man than the president is, but there is no other people available. We have a great lack of significant people, and one of the features is reliability, trustworthy. Again, in hiring people at Bell Labs, I was more interested in their reliability than was in their brilliance of grades in school. Yes, it's nice to know they can calculate a lot of things. Can I rely on them? Will they, in a crunch, work late and not complain? Will they give extra effort when the company needs extra effort? And we'll quietly arrange you later on, take goof off some afternoon here, there, and yon. We'll be nice about these things. But are they capable of suppressing their own desires frequently for the need of the whole company or the whole organization. Those people who can are the ones the organization wants. And those who can't, won't. Well, now, whether you can or not, it's useless to do what one of my friends, one of my boyfriends said. He was highly unreliable. He would have a job and one day he didn't want to go to work, he'd stay home. Or he'd go fishing if he wanted to. He was a kid, I said, <laughs> You want to be an airline pilot, I said, how do you expect to become an airline pilot if you're going to be unreliable like this? They can't depend on you. So if I were an airline pilot, I'd be reliable. I said to him, you won't be an airline pilot until you are reliable beforehand. Right? So you have to start exhibiting those characteristics of leadership and trustworthiness and open-mindedness and other things I'm trying to inculcate in you you have to exhibit them at the lower levels, so when you get higher levels, it'll be known that you're one of those people that they want. And this bigger view I'm talking about, the way my friend Kaiser, who was a very smart man, could not take this to that. He had his knowledge in one compartment, he could not sit in another compartment. He could not get out of the compartmentalization. A very capable man in many respects, but very limited in others. My contribution to Bell Labs, I'm inclined to believe, was heavily my ability to do the other. Now, part of it came, of course, from experience. I went out and sought these problems from other departments. I had to learn new jargon. I had to learn all kinds of funny things. In a sense, I was lucky. In a sense, again, given that situation, I behaved in such a way as I made some of my own luck later on. You can do this, and this is the thing I'm preaching to you. Luck favors a prepared mind. A prepared mind is a person who has digested some knowledge and put it away so that it can be used differently. I don't think I told you a story about me teaching at uh, University of Louisville, did I? No? Very, very early part of the war, I was teaching at University of Louisville in the engineering school. The dean was an ex-submarine commander who had been discharged because of physical disabilities. Well, he's what submarine commander would be. And he was teaching thermodynamics. And I was teaching calculus. And the students were complaining about the trouble they were having. So I asked the dean, may I sit in your class to see what's going on? The students are having trouble. He said, sure. So I sit in class. The dean writes down, D theta over theta. What is it? Class doesn't know. Next hour, I go into class and say, what's that? Oh, that's log x. Everybody knows it. What's that? D theta over theta? That's log theta. Plus c, of course. In one room with one professor, they don't know. The next hour, cross the hall. No further than across the hall, with a different professor, they know. That's called transfer of training, right? You've heard the word? They know it in one room. 
In the compartment of calculus and hamming lecturing, they know that cold. In a different room, in thermodynamics with a different teacher, they know nothing. How can I get you not to have that rigid divine? How can I get you people not to make this exactly the same mistake, not be able to see this was that? But it was the same problem. And all he had to do was build a filter like this, which was easy to design. He used his own methods. But I want to say again, giving credit for Kaiser, he sized the guy up and gave him a program which, given the cutoff the man wanted and given the data, supplied the answer. It designed the filter right then and there to fit the cutoff place where the man wanted. Because from run to run, the cutoff point might have been somewhat different. He delivered the right thing to the guy, insofar as he knew. He didn't know, Kaiser didn't know, you should really work in this instead of that. You need to know a great deal about everything, statistics and everything else. And you need to ask yourself, how does this apply to that? Oh, I learned that. Where else does it apply? Is it always this way or could it be something different? This is something I learned to a fair extent at Bell Labs by circumstance and also a fair extent from my friend John Tukey. I worked with Tukey for 10 years in a certain only technical sense. My boss had asked me one time, uh, could I do a small piece of computing for John Tukey? So I went over and got it. I decided John was a genuine genius. Difficult man, very difficult. But, and so I kept on for 10 years as his chief stooge in computing. Now he was a professor at Princeton, so he came to Bell Labs one or two days a week. He also worked at RCA and he did great many other things. He was down in Washington all the time. So I only had a day or two to work. I had the guts, periodically, to say to John, when he gave me an explanation, I don't understand. Because John was in the habit of snowing people. Well, if I said I don't understand, he would explain again. And being me, with lots of chutzpah, I'd say, I still don't understand. Most of the time, he would finally come down to my level and explain it to me. A couple of times, he says, you'll have to compute it anyhow which I think he was saying, you're just too stupid. But the bulk of the time, I got a good lesson from him by being obdurate and tough and said, I don't understand. I still don't understand. Explain it to me so I will know what I'm doing. I got a marvelous education from him. And again and again, I saw the following phenomena happen to me. Uh, in trying to explain to me, he said, well, John, John said, well, you know about so-and-so. Yeah, 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 I guess I know. It never occurred to me that was connected with the subject matter. Never in the slightest. For example, in radar data reduction after a while, eh, he pulled in polarization. Well, I knew about polarization of light, but it never occurred to me to think about the polarization of radar signals at that point in my life. He apparently had learned knowledge, so that almost everything was connected to everything else. Now, I had, to a great extent, done this compartmentalization. So I'm not blaming you having up to this point, but I'm saying, nobody told me this. I have told it to you. Start trying to fight down compartmentalization and limited knowledge and start thinking of how generally applicable. For example, feedback. Yeah, you learn feedback and you may have even learned stability. And such other criteria. You may have even learned Nyquist criteria for it. In a loose way, it also applies to organizations. I got enough time to tell you one of those ludicrous stories. The cafeteria at Bell Labs opened at 11 and ran on to 1.30 or something like that. And sometimes the line would be long and sometimes it would be short. And they had the idea that if they kept the record for a week and posted that length of line every time, that people would know to come some other time. Yeah. What everybody followed was very long at 11.30. They all shifted some other time. You never saw such an unstable method in your life. They did not have the wit to come to the math department to explain to them how do you make such a feedback system stable. So after about three or four weeks, they simply abandoned the effort to try and help people to level out the load so people wouldn't have to wait too much. They didn't have any idea the same principles of feedback apply. 
It was only two nights ago that I was reading a book on the history of automatic control, which goes back to the ancient Greeks. And I'm turning the last pages of modern times. You know, I realize what the man is saying is true. Modern feedback control theory came in during the Second World War. The big names that he cited, McCall and H.S. Uh, Black, feedback amplifiers, Nyquist, I knew them all. There were some other guys I didn't know directly, but I met them later on from MIT. But fundamentally, I met the people who made automatic control possible. Therefore, I probably have a different view than you do. To you, it's a bunch of formulas in a book. To me, it's a bunch of people. And I'm well aware of the difficulty. H.S. Black, he lived in New Jersey, and to get across, you went to Jersey City, you got on a ferry, you went across the ferry boat to New, J New York side, and you walked up about three blocks, you got to West Street Building. Well, on the ferry across the way, with the time, his newspaper, he grabbed it and he sketched the feedback path, the fundamental idea he sketched that morning right, running across the ferry. Not in his office working hard. He was thinking all the time. McCall was somewhat the same way. He thought about subject matters constantly. He wrote a classic in automatic control. It's out of date now, God knows, but he wrote a classic at the time. These ideas come in certain circumstances and they have to be transcended. At first, H.S. Black saw feedback only in electronic amplifiers, but gradually realized it applied to many other places. The Nyquist produced for you people the Nyquist criteria, which tells you how you can look at a feedback system, a limited number of them. On the other hand, all the questions are not answered. I spent a great many hours trying to figure out how, with mobile feedback loops, such as I had on a differentializer, could I in advance tell whether the hole was stable or unstable? Couldn't do it. Well, I'm headed next time for some lectures on simulation. Simulation is what we use machines for. So I've told you first what machines were, hardware, software, and applications. I went on to representation of information. I've just gone through four lectures on how you process information. I'm now going to go into how you use computers for simulation, finding out what the world is, and that begins manana.